Yeah, more everybody. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, again, it's five key tape breakdown that you had last week. We have to review numbers, graphs, and charts with clients. Here's how to do it so they don't get lost. Too many advisors, I mean, advisors for some reason love to do the facts and figures, love to do hypotheticals, love to do charts, love to do numbers, because that's how we live. That's not how clients live. They don't understand numbers. Even very, very smart, I give the example, when Jerry is going through numbers with me, I mean, I was, uh, I was a uh, uh, math guy. I was in the nuclear Navy. I was a, uh, studied physics. I, uh, so I understand math. But when at 50 or 60, at about 50, 55, and now at 60, when Jerry or Missy or Jeff starts going through numbers with me, what do you think happens to me? My brain. What do you think happens to my brain? Do I follow or do I not follow? Or does it go does it does it go like the peanuts teacher going wah 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 wah? Yeah, it's because it's I just turn it off because it requires mental energy and I just don't want to do it. I could probably follow it, but I don't want to. So I just turn it off. So we have to be very careful when we're reviewing numbers, graphs, and charts. We do it every day. They don't. And this tape breakdown will walk you through again and re help you re remind you of how you go through numbers, graphs, and charts, because those are powerful, but you have to make sure the client is following you. So please, please, please go back and look at that, okay? So now let's talk about a problem that we all have experienced in life, I, I think. Uh, what do we do when clients ghost us? Now, about a month ago, I talked about how you could do it with emails, some things that you could do with emails. But there's another thing that you could do, which is relatively inexpensive. So this isn't for everybody, but if, if it's for a big client, how many of you would like, how many of you first of all experience have experienced a big a, a case that just stalled and didn't go anywhere and they wouldn't return your call? Give me a wise or no's. Everybody's experienced it. Okay, so do you think it would be worth a thirty dollar investment to get them to pick up the phone and call you? Well, there's something that occurs in every action packed movie. And, and we haven't been using that tool, and it only costs about $30, $40. What tool do uh, uh, people on the run from the bad guys always use in the movie? Let's see if anybody can get it. What tool does, do the guys, in the, bad, the guys that are run from the bad guys always use in the movies? Ah, very good, Artie. A burner. And burners don't cost that much. So what do you think would happen if you sent a client a burner phone with a kind of a happy, fun note with your number already pre-programmed in it? Would that get their attention? May that get them to pick up the phone and call you? So when somebody's ghosting you, what you want to do is get them, get their attention. Sending another email, leaving out of the voicemail, is that going to get their attention? No, getting a package, getting a burner phone in the <laughs> in the mail, will that get their attention? So obviously you don't want to do this for everybody, but if you got a big case and they've uh, burned you, or burned you, ghosted you, this would be a great way to as, as the one last uh, chance to get home. And besides that, guys, do you think even if they don't move forward with it, are they going to remember you a year from now or two years from now when something happens? Yes. So that, that's an idea that I would absolutely think about using. Make sense? Science says using the three-second rule becomes remarkably pervasive, or pervasive, pervasive and persuasive. If you genuinely hope to create win-win outcomes, a little science goes a really long way. And think about this, guys. When things get, uh, uh, this is just validating what I've been teaching you forever. When a meeting gets rough, gets adversarial, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Yes, slow down. Slow down and talk lower, talk more quiet. And that's exactly what science tells us we should do. According to a study published in the Journal of Applied Psychology, sitting silently for at least three seconds during a difficult moment in negotiation, confrontation, or even conversation makes both people more deliberative and leads to better outcomes. Extended silence increases value creation by interrupting default 
fixed pie thinking. See, if we go, if we, if we go like a machine gun and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and as, as if we're in an intense situation, what tends to happen to our speed? Does it speed up or go or slow down when uh, uh, naturally or instinctively? Speeds up. So boom, 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 we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So by slowing down purposely, giving that three seconds before you answer, it gets rid of that fixed pie thinking. It slows people down. It breaks the paradigm. So people actually start thinking about what they're saying before they say it. Guys, if you've ever seen like a road rate in incident or you've ever seen people get in an argument, are they really thinking about what they're saying? Or has their brain turned off completely? So by us slowing down, we're, it's helping our brain work better. But what else is it doing? When we slow down, it helps our brain work better, but what else is it doing? If we don't give that other person anything to say, they're going to slow into right, John. They're going to slow down uh, as well. Does that make sense? So the old adage about when you're in, when things aren't going well, the the uh, conversation is getting a little bit uh, adversarial. Take a breath. Count to three. Lower the volume of your voice and uh, help them refocus on thinking about what they're saying before they say it as well as yourself. Make sense? These are the mistakes people make when listening according to a forensic interviewer. So this is also the thing that we want to be doing. Not only do we want to slow things down, we want to become better listeners. So we need to prevent falling prey to our biases. And we all have these biases. These are the big three that, uh, that the forensic um, uh, psychologists think was found. Succumbing to distraction. So guys, should your phone even be turned on while you're with a client or prospect? No. Because even if it's turned on, you're going to feel like you have to what? Look at it or respond to it. Never, 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 never. Uh, where do, let's see, um, this is, I haven't talked about this probably for years. Where did I have the clock? Where did I put my, the clock in my office? Yep, behind the client. So that I never had to look at my watch. I could glance right behind him and see what time it was. So you, 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 you uh, make sure when you're talking to somebody, you are how much focused on that person? 100%. So don't succumb to distractions. Number two, don't come in with assumptions. Don't come in with assumptions. If you want to know something, ask me. Don't assume that that's how, that's how the drama starts. If I assume they're a tire kicker and a plate licker, guess what? Is that going to be a good meeting or an adversarial meeting? If I assume they're a tire kicker and a plate licker, it's going to be adversarial. It's going to be poor. It's going to be bad, right? Uh, if I assume that they get something, what could happen? At the very end, they say no, and I get frustrated because I thought they understood it. So it goes back to the the the, the tape review or the uh, the uh, uh, the breakdown, tape breakdown. You're doing charts, numbers, and um, uh, graphs. They have to. You don't assume that they get what you're saying. They have to explain the graph to you. You don't explain the graph to them. They have to explain the numbers to you. You don't explain it to them. They have to say it. You never assume anything. How about a referral? Some of the biggest cases I've seen advisors lose are referrals. And why did they lose them? So the big cases, the biggest case I've seen guys lose is referrals. And they should have been laid down. They should have been easy, but they lost them. Why? They assumed because it was a referral that it was going to be what? Easy. That's right, Tom. They did not follow the system. Instead, they thought it was going to be easy. They took shortcuts. And when did they find out that they made a mistake? When it was too late. Does that make sense? So I never come in with assumptions. Well, in fact, I, you know, I take that back. I do come in with an assumption. When I meet a brand new person, guess what I assume? I assume that they do not want to do business with me. I assume that they do not want to work with me. And then it's my job to what? Turn that around. But that's the only assumption I ever make. I never assume that they get something. I never assume they're going to work with me. I never assume that uh, 
They're not closable. I just assume that, hey, it's my job when they come in to get them to want to work with me. It's not their job. Make sense? So let's talk about a little bit about um, uh, what people are looking for in retirement. What's retirement happiness? Morningstar did a study and to find out what makes people happy in retirement. More money doesn't hurt, but health and relationships with peers matter just as much to retirees. If you're looking for happiness in the retirement for your clients, you cannot forget relationships with adult children, buying a slick car or uh, uh, to cruise uh, the cul-de-sac or lounging at the beach in a uh, cab in Mazatlan, Mexico. It's the relationships. Uh, these are not things that are going to make them happy. It's funny. Re relationships with children, I would have assumed, would make them happy. But are there lots of parents and children out there who have reached impasses where they're not on the most friendly um, uh, and, and is that, I, I guarantee you that a lot of those people that live in the villages, do you think all of them have great relationships with their children, with their adult children? All those people that live in the villages down in Florida where they're living like teenagers and that their adult children think that the, their parents are what? Not acting their age, right? Crazy, exactly. So I would have assumed having a relationship with adult children was important or being able to buy, you know, the things they want to buy or being able to, to, to relax in, in wonderful places. What Morningstar uh, and the people that they hired to do this study found is that is not what makes people happy. Instead, it comes down to just three things. So what do you think they are? So, guys, what do you think um, makes people happy? Three things that make people happy. Just give me one of them. Well, relationships, we found out that relationships with children did not make them happy. So relationships with who? Good health, yep, good health is absolutely part of it. Good health, everybody's getting that one. Health is absolutely one of them. Knowing them, I know last, Lonnie, you got that, that's one of them too. Maintaining lifestyle, yep, Dean, sets up having enough money. Uh, oh, relationship with a spouse, Richard. You're right. Re uh, relationship with spouse, Steve got it too. But there's another relationship, relationship with else, spouse and somebody else. Who do you think it might be? Yeah, I would guarantee self. You're right, Steve, but it's somebody else. No, we just talked about kids, not kids, not God. So God is, is you know, having a good uh, spa friends. That's right, John, friends. So they found it's having enough money, not being filthy rich, but having enough money to maintain their lifestyle with peace of mind, that would make them happy. What did they find out when they had more money than that? Did not make them happier. Just having enough to live their lifestyle made them happy. Good relationship with peers and community. So community could include their faith community. So those of you that said God, yes, it, 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 uh, it, it's, um, they found that having a relationship one-on-one -on -one with God was less important to happiness than relationship with the community, their community that worships God, their church, their synagogue, their, their mosque, whatever it may be, that community. So having enough money, not being rich, but having enough money to live their lifestyle without, with peace of mind, good relationships with peers and community, and having your health. Those are the three things. So in order to assess trends in what's important in life, uh, Michael Finke, the professor of wealth management at American College of Financial Services and Research in the area of retirement spending, did this, uh, uh, looked at it, and they found a study of 20,000 retirees that began in 1994 and uh, followed up in 2018. When we run the analysis, what we see is that there are three core elements of life satisfaction. I call them the three pillars of life satisfaction in retirement. First pillar is money. Having more money does make you happier. It seems to have a relatively linear effect up to about $4 million. So that means having uh, uh, $4 million versus $1 million, you're going to be happier with $4 million. But it says after you get to $4 million, having $5 million does what? So having one million versus two million, two million is going to make you happier. Two, three million versus two million, three million is going to make you happier. Four million versus three million, four million is going to make you happier. But after four million, what happens? No change. That's right. The second pillar is relationships with peers. So why are the people in the villages happy? Why are the people in the villages happy? 
They're hanging with people who think like they think. Now, it doesn't have to be a huge community like that. Uh, peers could be your faith community, like we talked about. It could be um, your softball team. It could be your golfing buddies. But having great relationships with your friends. That's right, friends. And the third is health. So what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? You can't make them happy. We talked about this before. But you can make them unhappy. So by giving them a higher rate of return, does that make them happy or does that make them excited? Getting them a high, so getting them a 15% rate of return instead of a 10% rate of return, does that make them excited or happy? Dale's got it, excited. Does not make them happy. Because if they'd had no friends, they found out that they're, they, they just had cancer, will getting a 15% instead of a 10% make them happy? So it makes them excited. Because once they see that they made 15% versus 10%, how long does that excitement last? Does it last longer than a few minutes? Or do they just go back to their regular life? No, it doesn't, it doesn't last more than a few minutes. But can we make them unhappy? If they're down 30%, will they forget that in two minutes? I just got it. No. They're going to think about that constantly because it's now affecting what? Their peace of mind and having enough money to live the lifestyle they want. Even people with $4 million, if they're down 30%, so now they have $2.5 million, will that change the way they go on vacation? Will that change their mindset about going out to eat whenever they want to go out to eat? Will that change their idea about how, when to buy and replace a new car? I mean, two and a half million, are they, are they in a poor house? No. You may or may not have heard about this, the billionaire that was, he was worth $3 billion. He lost $2 billion, and what did he do? Committed suicide, why? Why? Yeah, just got it. Losing money affects people financially or losing money affects people emotionally? Emotionally. So we can't make them happy, but we can make them unhappy. But are there things that we can leverage with this info? The three things that make them happy are having peace of mind so they continue to live the lifestyle that they're used to, relationships with friends, their peers in the community, and health. Are there ways we can uh, leverage that to get in front of more people, to find more clients? What could we do to leverage that? Throw out some ideas on what we could do to leverage that. Do we have a system that you can do, uh, that you could use to do birthday parties for your clients every month? Not all your clients, but pick one client who you think would be the best client with the best friends with, that you would love to get the referrals from. And is it overly expensive or difficult to do? Those of you that have looked at it, is it overly difficult to do? It's cheap as heck. I mean, you're probably talking about mm, 100, 150 bucks. Yeah, and, or Dale brings up, we could do an appreciation party. Do we have, uh, do we have um, uh, client appreciation events that you could do? Uh, John brings up it's sending notes to clients four or two times a year. That's absolutely. So we have ways. What you want to do is you want to tap into, first of all, don't be the advisor who's trying to make the client the most money. Be the advisor to make sure the client has enough money to live the lifestyle they want. Is that the same thing? Make the most money possible or make sure the client has the money to live the, the lifestyle they want, whether the market's up or the market's down or interest rates are up or interest rates are down, or there's a world war, or there's a, uh, a COVID crisis or whatever, make sure they have the lifestyle. That's one thing. Number two is tap into helping them forge better relationships with their peers. Now, the nice thing is when you do that, their peers are seeing that your client's advisor is what? Awesome. So when you help your client have fun with their peers, their peers start to look at you as the guy 
who makes <laughs> a relationship that, that, that they want to work with because they, uh, their advisor is not doing that kind of stuff, are they? Could you also tap into the health? Yeah, you could have what? Could you uh, sponsor Tai Chi, yoga, uh, uh, bike rides? Could you uh, sponsor personal um, uh, trainers to come and see? Could you do all sorts of things? Turkey trots? Yeah, that's a great idea. Turkey trots. Could you do things that would increase their health? Hikes to local parks with a little uh, catered lunch afterwards that they could invite their friends to? Do you think if, you, if, you, if you're going to uh, sponsor a hike for your clients and they can invite all their friends, you're going to have a catered lunch, which wouldn't cost that much. Do you think they would invite their friends to go to a hike like that at a local park? I think so. Yeah. So tap into those things that make them happy. Quit, and <laughs> quit trying to make them the most money possible. Make sure that you've got their money protected. So that if the market goes to heck in a handbasket, they're still not going to have to change their lifestyle. It's not, and then tap into helping them forge better relationships with their peers and their community. And think about ways you can help them with their health. Make sense? So the last thing I want to talk about today is financial literacy. How literate are our clients when it comes to financial matters? Very literate or not literate? Not. Nah. So uh, the, uh, the Journal of Financial Services Representatives, uh, November 2021, talked about financial literacy for our clients. So um, there are lots of different places that are starting to uh, really talk about this now. So it will change. For our clients, it's probably not going to change an awful lot. But the younger clients, a lot of companies now, and you just see some of them here, Walmart, NFL, Delta, Disney, Walgreens, these are all just a small handful of companies now that are sponsoring financial literacy for their employees. Also, we've talked about this before, and I think the last week, where are there lots of websites now, blogs now, that are helping uh, potential clients get more and more literate? Yes, there are. So our clients who are retired probably are past that hump where they're not interested in getting financial literate, but if you want a long-term viewpoint on the market, you better be able to be um, more than just a, a financial advisor because your clients are getting smarter and smarter when it comes to financial literacy. But I just want to walk through some of these answers that they came up with. And this is your clients. So question number one, if an individual needed long-term care today, what would be the average annual cost for a private room in a nursing home? 16% thought 44,000. Uh, 30% thought, thought 63,000. 27% thought 72,000. So what percentage actually thought it was 84,000? And how much of a difference is it between 84,000 and 72,000? 84,000, 63,000, 84,000 and 44,000. Big or not big? That's a big difference. So what does that tell us about our clients' knowledge about how much it costs if they need long-term care? So is this something that we need to discuss with them? And do we have ideas on how they can get long-term care without expensive annual premiums? So is this a marketplace that we could capitalize on? A question that we could capitalize on? So number two, what percentage of pre-retirement income do experts think retiree needs to use as a benchmark for determining the amount of annual income they'll need in retirement? So what percentage of your working income are you gonna need so almost half of them thought you're going to need 80 or 90. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the right answer. Uh, the uh, 20, 20 to 30 percent of 10 percent, so at least that most people are realistic. 90 percent of people are realistic, but 37 percent thought what? Half of your income would be okay. Most of them, but only half. When you say most, the highest percentage knew that it would take 80 to 90 percent, but that means half people thought it was going to to uh, uh, cost a little bit more or less. So that's something that we're pretty good about talking to our clients about. An individual reaches age 65, has a life expectancy of age 85. So <laughs> what are their chances he or she will live beyond that age? Look at what percentage, a third of people got that right, two thirds of people got that wrong. And guys, this is a great, this is a great example of, is that simple math or hard math? 
an individual reaches 65 has an expectancy of 85. What are the chances he or she will live beyond that age? Is that simple or hard math? That means that half will live over 85 and half will live under 85. That's simple math, but how, how many people got that right? One third, two thirds got it wrong. So that's a great indication on why when you do, what we, we started off this call with, when you do charts, graphs, and numbers, should you assume that they get what you're talking about or do they have to do the math for you? Do they have to do the numbers for you? Do they have to explain the chart to you? They have to explain it to you because even simple math becomes hard for people. Make sense? At what age would a person who is age 55 in 2011 be able to collect full Social Security benefits? And that was 2011, so the answer is here. So three quarters of people knew how to do this or didn't know how to do this? So is there, a, is there room for Social Security education? Is there room for Social Security education? Yes, there is. Expenses for extended long-term care are covered by, uh, generally covered by who? Well, most people, most people knew that you're on the hook for that. To help ensure that an individual has enough money to make savings last his or her lifetime, experts are now recommending limiting the percentage they withdraw from their savings a year to what? Well, four to six, this, again, this was, um, this was done in 2011, and this is the, the, the most, uh, even though that's 10 years ago, it's the most recent um, large financial literacy, so it's still quoted quite a bit uh, out there. So four to six, is that anywhere near uh, uh, doable in today's world. No, it's more like what? 3%. Unless they use what? Do we have a way to bring it back to four to six? Not an FIA, unless they use what? Ah, sale or what? HCCMC, right. Very good, Bob. How much do people age 65 and older spend annually out of pocket costs for health care? Well, and this is 2011, so is it 4,900 anymore or is it much higher than that? Much higher. Oops. Which of the following is always true regarding income annuities? They have account balances that grow over time, 22%. They're not cost effective because the fees are higher than mutual funds, 14%. There is a specific age to withdraw money at 27%. It provides income that's guaranteed and cannot be outlived. 36%. What percentage of people understand annuities, guys? What percentage of people understand annuities? 36%. And is even this, um, even though this is um, true, we talked about last week, what percentage of people actually use this feature? Yeah, 2%. What was the average annual rate of inflation been over the last 20 years? What percentage of people got that right? Because that's still accurate. Now, that takes, that's as of the end of 2021. Obviously, in 2022, we're throwing this out to lunch now. But up to that point, what percentage of people understood what inflation was? A high percentage or a very low percentage? Very low. Suppose an individual retired at age 65, had savings of 100000 how much money could be withdrawn each month, assuming annual earnings of 6%, that no savings, that is principal plus interest, remained after 30 years? So spending it completely down after 30 years. Now, that's, that would require a calculator to do that. So this is more gut reaction to people. But <laughs> think about this. $600 per month would be what? $7,200 a year. And that's the right answer. And most people did get that. But look at, there, is there a percentage of people that had out to lunch expectations for what that would, would, would last? Yeah, almost half. What was the average monthly Social Security benefit paid in 2010 to, to the retired worker? This again, back in 2010, it was 1175. Does anybody know what it is today? Is it a lot higher than this today? I think it's like 1435, I believe, is the average. What is the average monthly, what is the greatest financial risk facing retirees? Ah, look at that. They get it. 
two thirds of them understand that longevity, running out, you know, living longer than their money is the number one risk. How much more will a person's monthly benefit be if they delay the Social Security benefits uh, from age 66 to 69? 24% higher. It's that 8% rule, right? So only 17% of people knew it. So did we find some soft spots here with Social Security? Is educating people on Social Security a good thing or a bad thing to, get, to, to educate them and find new clients? It's still a very, very good way to educate people, to get new clients. What percentage of middle-income Americans in their mid-50s to early 60s are at risk at, of not having adequate income to cover basic expenses? Almost half. So, but with two-thirds of people, though, think what? 80%, 65%. <laughs> so do, do our retirees or pre-retirees understand that a lot of people are in bad financial situation right now? Yes. So is it easy to convince people they need to think about it uh, locking in uh, that that four percent plus rate of return on their income for uh, for income, not for, uh, rate of return. Sorry, four percent or or more ability to to pull four percent or more from their with, uh, retirement savings to be able to live constantly. That's a, that everybody uh, or not everybody, but well, I guess eighty percent of people understand that that's an important thing. Which of the following statements is not true of reverse mortgages? Reverse mortgage can be used to access one's home equity prior to age 62. That's the only thing that's not true. What is true is reverse mortgage can be used to establish an emergency reserve fund that can be accessed as needed. A reverse mortgage can be used to access one's home equity for retirement income. A reverse mortgage can be used to purchase primary home. So guys, what percentage of people understand uh, the, one of the big tools that we use, HCCMs? What percentage of people understand it? A lot or a little? So think about this. The reason I bring this up is when we look at financial literacy, what are our USPs? Increase your retirement income by 25% or more. Is that something based on the financial literacy of this survey, something that people would, should really, would really be interested in? Increase your retirement income by 25% or more while reducing the chance of running out of money. And, and there are ways to do it without even moving any of your investments. Yes, it resonates. And how about the unique selling proposition where we say how to get long-term care protection for two years or more without expensive annual premiums? Should that be something that should resonate based on this uh, survey? Yes. How about have you applied for the program that will replace your spouse's income, Social Security income, when they die? Based on this survey, is that something that would resonate with people? So how often should you be out there using those three USPs based on people's knowledge? Yeah, daily is right. Daily, daily, daily. Does that make sense? Super, 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 super. So that's all I got to talk about today because what I want you to do is do a couple of things. One is be thinking, how can you tap into people's peers and community and making them happier? Or how can you tap into making people healthier? Also, think about ways you can be using our USPs, any of the three USPs, because it's things that people do not understand and need information on, and you will be the knight in shining armor. You will be the <laughs> come in riding the, the white stallion with this information. Make sense? So have we helped you do your uh, get in front of more people in an effective manner by developing those USPs and showing you how to do that? I would hope so, because... It, Marketing without those USPs is going to, is going to do you how much good in today's world. So all your marketing, whether it's no-cost marketing, whether it's low-cost marketing, whether it's lead marketing or seminar marketing, should you be emphasizing those three USPs? Yes, yes, and yes. Make sense? Awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate all you guys, and you guys have a wonderful week, and we'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.